in high school, I dreaded lunchtime. There were times when I wouldn't leave the classroom at lunch because I felt safer inside than out there. There were times when I wouldn't speak out loud because it felt dreadful. In case someone thought I sounded funny or got something to eat that someone found worth mocking. It was an awful, awful time. And a time which, even till recently, would come back to me in my bad dreams. I'd love to be able to say that that experience made me a better person, that I remembered it when the next new kid came to school, that I reached out and tried to help them because I didn't want them to go through what I went through. Unfortunately, that's not the choice I made. I became worse. I initially joined the cool kids club through sports and by letting people copy my homework. And I cemented my spot with them by bullying. I picked on new kids. I made one of my classmates the punching bag for the school. I stole detention slips from teachers and gave them out to kids for being fat or lame or stupid. I was tireless and without bounds, and I would stop at nothing to push my victims to the brink. So much so, in fact, that the boy that I picked on the most in high school, Gary, once smashed a glass bottle in the courtyard and pointed a shard of glass at me, daring me to push one more inch. I didn't. Not that day, but I did the next. It wasn't as if people around me at the time weren't there to tell me that this is not how I should be acting. I was constantly told by my family, my teachers, even some of my friends, that I had to be better than this. And yet, despite hearing everything that was said, I listened to none of it. I was quite literally deaf to it. And it was only four or five years ago that I realized that it was my fear of being bullied again that numbed my senses back then. It was my fear of being made the victim again that made me so cruel to my victims. I was bent on fitting in, even if it came at the expense of others' well-being and happiness. It was around this time that the realization struck me that I stumbled across Randy Cuson, a 55-year-old man who'd spent most of his adult life fighting fires in the oil patch. And he put my fire out pretty good, too, when I first met him. He decided not to invest in the first startup that I tried. But Randy did give me a second chance by asking me if I'd join his company to try to develop new technologies that we could take to the real world. And that wasn't the only chance that Randy took. His partner, Greg and Randy, decided within a year of me joining the company that we're going to try to solve one major problem that we all face today as humanity, the problem of the global emissions of CO2. Humanity emitted over 40 billion tons of CO2 in 2015. And to give you an idea of how big that number is, it's literally 100 times more than the weight of every single human being on the planet, every single 7 billion plus one of them. But for a non-toxic gas that doesn't even smell, it has a pretty bad rap. It's usually talked about in the same vein as toxic emissions or acid rain. But I think it's important that we establish some perspective on CO2. CO2 is a big problem in terms of the excess emissions that we have in the atmosphere. But does it really justify being villainized? Do we really have to look at CO2 as a villain? CO2 is made of two elements, carbon and oxygen. And if you were to break the human body into the various elements that make us, over 80% of the human body is the same elements, carbon and oxygen. I don't believe that CO2 is the enemy, and I don't think that a low-carbon future is the vision that we should strive for. Instead, I think that this loop of CO2 needs to be closed, that CO2 needs to be used and reused instead of being emitted into the atmosphere or buried underground. I guess what I'm trying to say is what if we gave CO2 a second chance? What if we could turn CO2 into something valuable? Traditionally, people look at CO2 and capture it the same way that we catch water with our sponge in our kitchens. We take fine powders, 
we squeeze some CO2 in only to have that CO2 wrung out and injected into geological formations. It's buried deep beneath the earth, literally like a waste that needs to be forgotten about, as something that has no potential of value or for change. But our approach is different. We take low-cost powders like pet coke or fly ash or graphite, like in this jar, and we capture CO2 in this, stabilizing it into a solid form. This powder that I hold here today is about 20% CO2 that we've captured. The intent here is not to re-emit this, but to keep it in this form. Now, you might be wondering, so what now? <laughs> like, is this powder worth anything except to store CO2? And that's a very valid question. Uh, about two and a half years ago, when we embarked on this journey, that was one of the first questions that we had. And we had absolutely no idea. And so we reached out, we used our curiosity, tried to follow the scientific method, and really just took wherever the internet took us. We uh, used Google, we used LinkedIn, we creeped professors on Facebook, <laughs> and, and really just tried to see if anyone could take some of this and help us see if it has value, if this powder was worth something. And what we found since then has been quite a story. We found that it can be used in concrete, like in our buildings, to make them as much as 35% stronger. We found that it can be used in garbage bags and yoga mats and other plastics to make them as much as 22% stronger while also making them more sustainable for the world. We've even found that a derivative of this powder can be used as a coating on solar panels to increase their efficiency at harnessing the power of the sun and creating electricity that we can use. But by far, the most awe-inspiring result that we've seen in the last two years is when an associated researcher found that this can be used in pharmaceutical drug delivery. We found that this powder can store as much as 10 times more medicinal drugs to target cancer cells in the human body. And that's important. What it means is that we can target more aggressive tumors and even at later stages of detection, be able to attack and improve chances of recovery for patients that otherwise would not have as much of a chance today. I believe that it's those kind of results, the ones that show that CO2 could be looked at as a bully or as a villain, but rather as a molecule that deserves a second chance. I believe that it is results like the pharmaceutical work in the plastics that have led us into the Carbon X Prize, a global competition that is between companies that can take CO2 and create valuable products from them. We're on track to scale up our production to a few hundred kilos of this powder a day by the end of the year. The potential of this as a commercial product, that excites us. We have already commercialized one application of this in paints to protect concrete from corrosion, and we hope to do more in the next year or two. And it is these kind of results that drive us every day, that make us feel that CO2 does deserve a second chance. Many of us are wary of giving out second chances. And I understand that. The world is much better and simpler to look at when we think about it in terms of good and bad, of black and white, of villains and heroes, and of bullies and victims. But I'd urge you to consider, though, does writing things off, whether they be people, places, or ideas, really help? Because I'd suggest that it actually stifles innovation in our evolution and only feeds the status quo. Even to this day, my mind wanders back to those days in high school when I made life miserable to many of the people that I saw at school. I think back to the people that stood by me in those times. And when things get rough at work, I feel that I owe it to these people not to give up on this problem just the way that they didn't give up on me. I feel there's no more meaningful way for me to try to redeem myself. I talked earlier about that moment in the courtyard when Gary dared me to push one more inch. I'm trying to push one more inch today, slowly, but in a more positive direction. Even to this day, I feel fortunate that 10 years ago as a bully, there were people that stood by me, even though I let them down over and over again. And I'd urge you all to give second chances more often, because I believe that if we are willing to re-examine ideas, places, or people that we've written off, we might just find that they're full of possibility. 
I believe that CO2 deserves a second chance. And I believe that it'd be the most wonderful thing if everyone can start asking if CO2 could be used for this or that or something else. Because I believe the second chance for CO2 or this powder could come from anyone, including you. And I hope that it's this kind of open curiosity that leads us into the future, as it is this that has led us to this point today. Humanity advanced around the Stone Age through the iron, the bronze, the industrial ages, all the way through to the information age that we live in today. But I believe that this is still only but a progression in our journey, and that the next step will be the carbon age, an age full of possibilities and redemption, an age that is not defined by fake news or monsters or bullies, but by the notion of hope from unlikely places and by the promise of transformation and change for all of us. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you there.